if you want to look at the slides, because I'm going to present PowerPoint slides, they're at um, this URL right here. Okay, so you could pull them up on your on your various electronic devices. So notice the title of my talk. It's Economics of Fractional Reserve Banking. So that means I'm not going to talk about whether or not fractional reserve banking is fraudulent. Okay, I'm an economist, um, not a legal expert. Uh, that's not my area of expertise. Though I do have, I have ideas on it. So we're going to stick to the positive analysis of, of, of the um, consequences, uh, the economic consequences of fractional reserve banking. All right, let me just, they won't all be like that. Let me just mention um, that fractional reserve banking uh, is inherently inflationary and generates the business cycle. That is a cycle of inflation followed by recession. Okay, that's the conclusion of economics, not ethics. I'm not going to go into too, that too much today because that will be Roger Garrison's topic uh, tomorrow or the next day. Uh, but also keep in mind that it's a hybrid of two forms of banking, each of which in their pure form are perfectly fine on the free market, do not cause uh, uh, business cycles or inflation. One is loan banking, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end of the lecture, and the other is deposit banking. So in their pure forms, these types of bankings, banking are benign, are welfare improving, do not cause um, inflation. When they're mixed together, it's, it's like mixing uh, you know, sodium, and, you know, which can't hurt you, and, and, and chlorine together and getting sodium chloride, or rather taking them apart and, and, and um, you know, eating chlorine alone, consuming chlorine alone, which, which, which will kill you. OK, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the basic concepts are going to have to do with um, financial assets uh, and liabilities. So just when we talk about assets, it's a claim to a present or future sum of money or stream of money payments. A present sum of money is the ownership of the money itself. Okay, So if you have a claim to a sum of money, a present claim to a sum of money that I'm holding, that means that that sum is yours. I'm only holding it um, uh, as a result of a contract in which I'm storing it for you or moving it someplace like an armored car company, you are still the owner. You have not loaned that to me. You have a present claim, okay? If you loan it to me for three months or 30 years, that's a, that's a, 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 a credit claim. That's a claim to a future sum of money or a future stream of payments. A liability is an obligation to make money payments, either now, right away, when the person comes in with the claim, or in the future, according to uh, a financial contract, like a bond contract. Now let's just talk a little bit about the Bank T account. Um, it's a simplified accounting statement, all right, that shows, and those of you who have had economics, who have had economics, will, uh, will recognize it. It basically shows the bank's assets and liabilities. It's a simplified um, balance sheet of a bank's uh, assets and liabilities. So let's just take an example. The first national bank, let's say it has deposits of $100. Those are liabilities because that's an obligation to pay on demand um, a claim held by a depositor. Um, and let's say it has reserves of $10. That's a, a present sum of money that it owns and keeps on hand, either in its own vaults but, or ATM machines. Uh, but in the modern world today, uh, most of those reserves are really just computer entries at the regional Federal Reserve Bank. And loans, okay? Those are assets because that is, that, that is the, the title to a future stream of payments from the borrowers that they have, uh, the bank has loaned to. So the bank's liabilities include deposits, and the assets include loans and reserves. Uh, include, there are much, many more assets and liabilities on, on, a, on a real bank's balance sheet but this is for simplicity. So in this example, notice that um, R, the reserves, represent, about 10, represent exactly 10% of deposits, okay? The rest of that deposited money is loaned out. So now let's take an example. Uh, suppose there's $100 of currency in circulation in this economy, um, and we want to determine the bank's impact on the money supply. Um, and we're going to posit three different, suppose three different cases. One where there's no banking system, 
uh, two with, a, with there's a, what's called the 100% reserve banking system, where the bank holds 100% of the customer's deposits, okay, and makes no loans. And the third is the fractional reserve banking system. So in case number one, no banking system, there's just currency, or if it's a gold standard, gold in circulation, there are no banks, the total money supply is equal to $100. That's simple. Oh, let me go back for a second. Now, no matter what anyone does, if, if one person makes a loan to someone else, or if, so, if one person um, buys someone else's mortgage, okay, makes a mortgage loan to someone else, uh, there's no change in the money supply. There's a change in who owns uh, cash balances, okay? So if I loan you $10, I no longer have that $10 to spend, but now you have the $10. That does not increase the money supply, okay? No matter how many, uh, how many loans are made in this economy, it doesn't affect the money supply. It doesn't affect the quantity at any given moment of gold, or if this is government dollars, fiat dollars in the economy. Now let's introduce banks, 100% reserve banking system. This type of a banking system did exist um, in the um, 17th century, the 1600s. Uh, gold, goldsmith bankers initially held 100% reserves. Um, so if the, the public deposits the $100 at the first national bank, well, what it's done is really replaced its gold or its, its uh, dollars with checking account dollars. Okay. Uh, the bank doesn't make any loans. It holds the full $100 in, let's say, notes in reserve. Um, and in exchange, it, it, it establishes liabilities of, of, of $100 in checking account money that it owes to the customer or to whoever the depositor names on a check. So the money supply is always equal to currency plus deposits in the economy. That's a simple um, definition of the money supply, M1. Uh, in this case, there's no more currency in circulation. It's all held in the banks, and it's all backing the $100 in deposits. But note, the sum doesn't change. The composition of the money supply changes. Now there's more deposits in the economy and less um, currency. So in a 100% reserve banking system, banks do not affect the size of the money supply. Okay. And now let's talk a little bit about bank reserves. In a fractional reserve banking system, banks keep a fraction of deposits as reserves. That's what it means. It doesn't hold the full amount of the deposit. It holds some fraction, 80%, 20%. In today's economy, the, the legal minimum is 10%, um, at least behind checking accounts. For savings deposits, the legal minimum is now zero. Okay, it used to be 3%. The Fed establishes reserve requirements. That's the uh, legal minimum amount of reserves that must be held against a given amount of deposits. That is the legal ratio of reserves to deposits. Um, banks may indeed hold more than the minimum amount. In fact, today they do, um, for a number of reasons. One, uh, the uncertainty of the future, the fact that no one really knows the full effects and costs of Obamacare. No one knows what's going to happen to the uh, system of taxation in, in, in the face of, of the huge debt that the US government has piled up. So banks are, are not loaning for that reason. They're hold, holding money. They're holding excess reserves, we call them, more, more reserves than they need to hold. And because the, the, the Fed is paying them uh, one quarter of 1% per year on their deposits, okay? So that's a completely safe investment, allowing the Fed to just hold um, these computer entries, which are, your which are your reserve deposits, okay? The Fed is the banker's bank. It holds the banker's deposits. Those deposits, in addition to the money in the ATMs that the banks have, the, the currency, and uh, the very little that they have in their vaults, um, those all together are its reserves. Okay. So banks are probably holding nearly 100% reserves today. That, that will change. The reserve ratio we symbolize by R, it's the fraction of deposits that banks hold as reserves. Okay. 
The legal reserve ratio in the US today, as I said, is 10%. Because of certain things, it's actually much less than that. Um, there's there's uh, these um, sweep accounts in which the uh, banks are allowed, uh, after banking hours, to take people's deposits and to put them into um, uh, interest-bearing uh, money market deposit accounts and other things, okay? So they can actually earn um, interest on them. Or another way of putting it is uh, the reserve ratio is the total reserves as a percentage of total deposits, okay? So that's about, a, you know, that, let's say it's 100% today, the actual reserve ratio. The legal reserve ratio, again, is only 10%, according to, 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 to the, the Fed regulation. Okay, so now let's look at how the fractional reserve banking system affects the money supply. So we have the simplified T account. People have deposited $100, and for the time being, banks are holding the $100 in reserves. In a normal situation, they're not going to be doing that because they're foregoing something very important. They're foregoing interest. So if we suppose that the reserve ratio is equal to 10%, and the first national bank here um, wants to be fully loaned up, you want to loan as much as you can legally in order to earn the maximum interest, um, they'll loan all but 10%. So they'll loan out $90, and they'll retain in reserves the minimum legal requirement of $10. So now we have 10% reserves, or fractional reserves. But notice, the depositor still has his $100. That's part of the money supply. But then now the currency, and the banks don't actually lend currency, but it's a little bit simpler to put it this way. The $90 that it's loaned out to someone, that's in addition to the money supply. So the banks, through fractional reserve banking, have created an additional $90, okay? Depositors still have the $100,000 in deposits. The borrowers now have $90 in currency. Together, that equals $190. Prior to that transaction, prior to someone putting $100 into this fractional reserve bank, uh, a bank, there was only $100 in the economy. Now there's $190. So when banks make loans, they create money. That's a key insight. Okay. All economists... Keynesians to Austrians, um, all of them accept, accept this. The borrower gets the $90 in currency, an asset that's counted in the money supply, but also gets $90 in debt. So um, there's no new financial wealth, right? You have 90 more dollars, but you owe the bank $90. However, there is an increase to the money supply. Fractional reserve banking system creates money, but not wealth. Um, so now let's take this a step further. This is the money supply process, okay? Uh, the, the guy who borrowed the $90, he doesn't want to just keep it there. I mean, he's paying interest for that. He's borrowed it because he wants to either spend it on consumption or because he wants to, let's assume, invest it at interest in either uh, adding to a small business or, or investing in stocks or bonds. So in doing that, he pays someone else the $90. That person, okay, let's say he hired um, someone to um, uh, help extend his cleaning, uh, uh, help uh, build on to his cleaning, uh, dry cleaning establishment. That person then, then takes the $90, the $90 in currency, deposits it at the second national bank, that is his or her own national uh, own bank, and that bank now has an additional $90 in reserves. But if, as is the case, the reserve ratio is 10%, this bank is going to want to earn interest on the $81 it can loan out. It only needs to hold $9 to back up the deposits of 90. So that's what its, 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 its assets look like now. Now we have $9 in reserves, which is required, and $81 more in loans. That's 81 plus the 190. So now the money supply has increased even more. This money is being spent as we go along, by the way, and that's beginning to raise prices. And that's why fractional reserve banking is inherently inflationary. Um, all right, so we can take it one or two more steps. All right, so the second national bank's borrower, okay, because borrows the $81, doesn't want to keep it in hoards 
or you know, keep it under his pillow and fondle it unless he's some kind of a weird um, miser. Um, any case, I'm sure there's none of you here like that. Um, they, they now deposited at their bank, the Third National Bank. So now, the Third National Bank's reserves go up by $81. And they have an additional $81 in deposits and liabilities. But they only have to back that by 10% or $8.10. So you get the idea now, okay? It will loan all but 10% of the deposit, again, in a normal situation. In a non-recessionary, non-crisis situation, it will keep fully loaned up. And there, it will make a loan of, of $72.90 and keep $8.10 in reserves. That loan is now additional currency that inflates the money supply or expands the money supply even further. So here's what we get. You get the original deposit. The original deposit doesn't change the money supply initially, okay? $100 in currency is exchanged for $100 in deposits. But once the money's loaned out, you get 90 new dollars, in the next round, 81 new dollars. In the third round, $72.90. And it's gonna continue. This is an infinite geometric series, okay? The total money supply will be equal to $1,000, okay? That is the total amount of, of deposits, the original deposit, um, plus all of the um, created deposits that the banking system has created. Now you can see something here that the banks themselves they don't understand when economists say you create money. Because this guy said, look, somebody deposited that money. I didn't create any money, I just loaned part of it out. At each, at each step, they're going to say, oh, I didn't create that money. I just loaned out what was deposited. But the system as a whole creates the new money. The, the fractional reserve banking system creates the new money. Okay? This analysis was first really elaborated um, in 1915 by an American economist and sort of an Austrian named um, Herbert Davenport, but then really brought out uh, in the 1920s um, by um, C.A. Phillips, who also wrote a very Austrian-oriented book explaining the Great Depression. So the Austrians were instrumental in developing this very important analysis. And actually in his book in 1912, Mises speaks as if this is what the case is. He doesn't analyze it, but he speaks as if, well, you know, this is obviously what, what's happening. So in this, in this example, $100 of reserves generates $1,000 of money. So when you or I, let's say you, let's say you, get, uh, you, have, um, you graduate from college and your generous aunt gives you a, a $1,000 as a, a present, and you put $1,000 into uh, your checking account, that's going to ultimately create $10,000 in the economy. That's not 10,000 new dollars, that's 10,000 deposit dollars. You have to subtract from that the $1,000 of currency that you put in, because you no longer have the currency, you have the, the deposit. So it creates 9,000 new dollars, okay? That is the $10,000 in deposits minus the $1,000 in currency that you took out of circulation and put in the bank. And this is known as, as the money multiplier. I don't have to mathematically prove it to you, but the amount of money in the banking system um, that gener generates with each, the amount of money that the banking system generates with each new dollar of reserves, that's equal to one over the reserve ratio. So, in the old days, when the Fed started, the reserve ratio used to be 25%, which if you take this formula, the money multiplier, one divided by 0.25 gives you four. The money multiplier was four. Each new dollar that was deposited, okay, each new dollar of currency could create ultimately at a maximum four new dollars of, um, of, of, of bank deposit money. Now it's 10%, the Fed has continually lowered it. It used to be 13% up until 1980 and then it was lowered to 10%. So now that it's, it's 10%, um, one over 0.1 gives you 10. The money multiplier, which is the maximum amount of new money that can be created by each dollar of reserves, is now 10. Okay. So in our example, R equals 10%, the money multiplier equals 1 over R, which is 0.1 equals 10. Okay. Now, does each dollar that we actually put in, again, before the crisis situation, actually create, did it actually create 10 new dollars? No, it was probably about $2.50. There's a couple of reasons. 
Banks did hold excess reserves to some extent, even, even in normal times. But also, when, when, you, when people get paid, they don't put all of, their new, all of the money they get paid into a checking account. They hold some in currency. So if you, at each stage, if each person holds some as currency, that reduces the money multiplier. Okay? The key is, though, that there is a money multiplier. Okay, now, this is how you or I would increase the money supply. But, but, but at the same time, people are, are depositing currency. Others are taking it out. So overall, if you didn't have a central bank, and you just had people, you had fractional reserve banking, but you just had you know, people going and taking, uh, depositing money or taking currency out, you wouldn't get much of an inflation at all, okay? Because the, res the reserves that are being put in by you and I for currency are being taken out. Uh, let me give you an example. During Christmas, people like to walk around with, um, they make many small purchases. So during the Christmas holidays, they like to pull out um, cash. Okay, during the shopping holidays from uh, you know, the end of, 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 of um, November, right after Thanksgiving, or even now, it's actually moved up to after Halloween, at least in the Northeast. All the Christmas lights go up after Halloween and people start shopping. So people want to walk around with more currency, they withdraw it from the bank. Let's say that people withdraw um, a total of, of uh, let's say, $20 billion from the bank throughout the United States okay, in currency. That would decrease the money supply because this works in reverse. You, if you take reserves out, if you take 20 billion of reserves out, that 20 billion is backing up 100 billion of deposits. So p banks would have to shrink their deposits by 100 billion dollars. Okay? The Fed does not let that happen. I'm jumping ahead of the story. What would the Fed do? At the same time that you and I are withdrawing currency to pay merchants during the shopping season, the Fed is injecting an, the 20 mil, billion dollars by simply printing it up out of thin air, which we're gonna to get to in a moment, okay? At the end, when the merchants deposit all the cash that they've um, earned during the shopping days, at that point, reserves begin to go up and the Fed drains money out, okay? So you and I have a strong control of the money supply. That's what a bank run is. If we all, if we all left today and withdrew money from the, um, from, from the, from the banks, the whole system would collapse because really they can only pay out about 10% okay, of what they owe, owe all, all, all depositors. Um, when I get some water, I'll tell you an interesting story. When I was a student at Boston College um, during the heyday of the anti-Vietnam War protests, there was an underground newspaper, I think it was called the Phoenix, that used to report, it was for college students, and there was about um, 250,000 college students in the Boston area, so it was a great place to go to, to, go to college. Um, in any case, they would report on you know, various events that students would be interested in, concerts and so on and so forth. Well, uh, one, one, it would come out every Friday. So on one Friday, there was a, a full page ad taken out by some radical Marxist economists from local Boston, uh, they're actually one of the PhD students, graduate students, um, from MIT, from Harvard, and, and uh, Tufts, and all these other Boston colleges. And they urged all the students in Boston, you know, 250,000 students in Boston, the following Friday, okay, and we didn't really have many credit cards back then, I mean, you know, our parents did, but we didn't, we just had checking accounts, to take all the money out of your checking account. Every student should take, go to the bank, take all the money out of your checking account, what would that do? That would create real havoc with the Boston banks. They would have to, they would have to stop paying for a while until they ordered more re currency from the re uh, Federal Reserve Banks. So they thought this would be a great way to protest against the war. And you know, we all thought it was great. We all talked about it. Yeah, it was great. You know, I, I was in economics, so I sort of knew that was true. I wasn't a Marxist or anything. I was still a libertarian. But I thought, this is great. Uh, but, but, you know, but then after a few days, they were partying and so on. We all forgot about it by the next Friday. So the whole... <laughs> so, so the whole thing was a dud. I mean, so it never came off. But it would have worked. It would have worked. It could work today. Um, now, you're not allowed to, ad that's against the law, to advocate that people withdraw money from banks because the banks are unstable or something. You can't really do that. So I'm not advocating that. I, I, see, a, I, I see a drone sitting, a small one, right outside the window there. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, 
Okay, so now, all right, now we're going to get into the Fed. Uh, if, I'll, I'll only take questions if it's a point of information. In other words, is there something you didn't understand? Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay, well, uh, that's loan banking. I'll get to that at the end. Don't raise your hand again. Not my oh, okay. <laughs> only, only kidding. Okay. Okay, so central banks and monetary policy. Okay, now, now, now here, here, here's you know, the Mordor of, of uh, our system. The central bank. An institution that oversees the banking system and regulates the money supply. Sounds very innocuous and not at all evil, like it really is. Um, and I mean evil, evil is as evil, evil does. I mean, it has evil effects um, from the point of view of consumers. So the monetary policy is the setting of the money supply by policymakers in the central bank. Remember, monetary policy is not the setting of interest rates. They cannot set interest rates. What they can do is they can beat them down by creating reserves that the banks get and then loan out. Okay, so they, to keep reserves down, you have to keep creating new money, okay, or new reserves for the banks. And, and the banks are, and, and, and the Fed is doing that every month. It's creating 85 billion new dollars in reserves for the banks. So um, the Federal Reserve or the Fed is the central bank of the U.S. We all know that. Wish we didn't. Um, Federal Reserve System consists of the Board of Governors, uh, you know, which are located, there's seven members, appointed by the President for 14 year terms, um, located in Washington, D.C. There's 12 regional Fed banks, used to have more power in the old days, they don't have much today, located around, ah! <laughs> <laughs> I actually think that's from the drone. Um, so anyway, uh, 12 regional banks. The Federal Open Market Com Committee has the real power. That's um, all seven of the Board of Governors, including you know who, and uh, the president of five of the regional reserve banks, and the New York president is always on that committee. The other four are on, uh, the other banks are on a rotating basis. Um, and they decide monetary policy, and they meet every six weeks um, for two days and then they give you uh, a completely incomprehensible two-line press release, and they issue, reissue, uh, issue the minutes the months later, um, but yet don't tell you who says what. So um, as this old left-wing uh, Democratic um, uh, representative from Texas, Henry Gonzalez, uh, proposed, and I'm all for this, every minute of, of those meetings should be videotaped and released the next day or the next week. Um, all right, so the open market operations is a number of different ways to control the amount of reserves in the banking system. Open market operations are the kinds that they use on a daily basis, okay? Every single day uh, at, at 10, 15 or so, there are open market operations. Um, let's see. Okay, all right, now, it, this is how the, I mean, this is a funny, I'll give you a couple of other pictures, but so notice the, the money, the dollars go out from, from the Fed, from the FOMC, uh, you know, Bernan but Bernanke has really the biggest influence on that committee. Um, so the green dollars are going out, they go to the commercial banks and it buys their bonds, uh, or it goes to the public. It doesn't usually buy bonds directly from the public. It really buys bonds from thir around 30 primary dealers, privileged Wall Street banks that get a high price for the bonds that they sell to the, um, to the Fed. Where do the green things come from? Just print it up. It's not even print it up. It's just a keystroke in cyberspace, simply adding to the bank's reserves. Just comes out of, out of it's ex nihilo, come from nothing, from Latin from nothing. So, um, so yeah, they want to control recession. They create recession, but anyway, <laughs> forget that, I got this online. The central bank, <laughs> creates the dollars on the left side, right? The banks have purchased in the past government bonds, so the dollars go to the banks, the bonds go to the central bank, and it becomes part of their balance sheet. Not only are they buying bonds, but we know they're buying mortgage-backed securities, they're buying long-term long government bonds, they only used to buy short-term um, securities, T-bills. But now that the banks have reserves, they have to loan them out. The only way they can loan more money out at a given interest rate is to make it more attractive to the borrowers. They have to lower the interest rate. That's how the Fed lowers the interest rate. It first creates more reserves. 
So the Fed does control the money supply. Not perfectly, but it controls the money supply. That's monetary policy, not setting interest rate. And it can only really set one interest rate that can really peg um, by continually pumping money in. And that's the overnight rate. It's called the Fed funds rate. If you want information, that's the overnight rate uh, at which banks will loan money, excess reserves to one another. The, and the right side you can forget because the central bank almost never decreases the money supply. That just shows you that when they sell bonds back to the banks, the banks pay them. And they don't, the banks don't actually pay them. They just write down the bank's reserves okay, in their um, reserve deposits. It's just, it's just all done in cyberspace. Uh, speaking of which, um, I went and I found the names of these people that actually do it. Um, per, the Permanent Open Market Operations Group, um, every day they get together about 10, 15, and um, I have it here. There's, um, oh yeah, here it is. Um, so Mr. So, so he's since retired, Brian Sack, or he was sacked. Okay, there's, there's, there's controversy on it. Pun intended. So he um, has a PhD in economics from MIT, 40 years old. The supervisor is this mysterious guy, Josh Frost, who has a mathematics degree um, and a degree from um, NYU. And then there were three traders as of 2011. Tiffany Wilding, a 26-year-old um, NYU student. Uh, Blake Griffin and James White. 20, they're just traders, regular guys hanging out. There they are. It's a picture you rarely see. That, that's, that's the federal, that's the open market trading desk. That's where they actually do it. Three blocks from my office in Pace University. I'm three blocks from the Federal Reserve uh, Bank, the New York Fed. It's the, all done at the New York Fed. That is the most powerful regional bank. Okay. Um, notice there's not even any Bloomberg um, terminals there. You can't see any, any, anything. I mean, they're just you know, hanging out. Now, no, they're not just, just hanging out, not, okay. Um, on a recent Thursday morning, um, what Mr. Frost and his five young colleagues did over a 45-minute period might have unsettled even a seasoned Wall Street hand. They bought, in a 45-minute period, $7.8 billion of treasuries in 45 minutes. Now, that means that if, that, if banks were going to be fully loaned out, which they're not, that could increase to that would increase the money supply by seventy-seven billion dollars in forty-five minutes. Okay, it would take a, a few weeks as it went from bank to bank, but that's what they would do. Um, so, how do they do it? Okay, well, uh, well, let's delve deeper. As offers to sell, so so what happens is uh, at ten fifteen, um, one of them pushes a button on a computer, and across Wall Street, three musical notes: an F, an E, and a D. Fed sound on the trading terminals. That's Fed time. I mean, that's okay, the Fed's in the market. That's what it means. Fed's ready to buy. Um, and uh, alerting traders, the Fed is in the market. So in fact, since there's only 30 of these banks, you're setting yourself up to have to pay high prices, right? You're setting yourself up for the, these banks to collude, these primary dealers, Wall Street banks. Um, so as offers to sell Treasury, so then the banks start making offers to sell these securities in exchange for, for these reserves that are created out of thin air. Um, there's a, the Fed has a computer algorithm that somebody developed which determines which ones to accept, okay? Um, the computer compares the offers from, the wall, from Wall Street against market prices, so the prices that were paid, what Wall Street's offering, and the Fed's own calculation of what constitutes a fair market VAT price. Which is interesting. I mean, that's distinct from what Wall Street's offering and, what's, and what, what, what the, um, the, the, the market prices have been for these things that can be sold, you know, are being sold not to the Fed, but to, to others in the market. Okay, so, you know, what, 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 does that, what does that mean? Okay, are they subsidizing, which they probably are, these, these large Wall Street banks through this process? And, and no doubt they are. Um, that is, instead of opening it up to everybody, to allow everyone to you know, offer, offer securities at, at different prices. It's just these 30 primary dealers. Uh, the real work is done by the three traders. Uh, Tiffany Wilding isn't there. I was hoping to see her, given her name. I want to see what she looked like. Um, but the, so who are referred to during the operation as Trader 1, Trader 2, and Trader 3. They sit at a long table against the wall, tapping at several screens. Um, while she reviewed she reviewed the stream of offers, and then the price is finally accepted by the algorithm, Trader 2, 
Blake, Blake Gwynn uh, double-checked her decisions. So Tiffany was doing the, the, the accepting of the offers, or at least monitoring the offers that were being accepted by the computer algorithm. Blake Griffin, 29, double-checked her decisions, and James White made a duplicate of everything in case the computers crashed. I mean, this gives you real confidence, right, in, in the Fed, Fed system, okay? It's a bunch of kids and making sure the computer doesn't crash and stuff. <laughs> Sounds like Briggs in, in the tech room. Um, well, we could probably do it from here, I mean. Um, okay, so that's how it actually happens, okay? The Fed just simply writes a check on itself in the old days, it wrote a, a paper check on itself, okay, and just sent it to the bank. Um, actually, let me, make, let me clarify this a little bit more. If you have a used car that you want to sell for $5,000, the Fed now has the power to buy anything it wants, right? It can buy GM. I mean, it can buy anything it wants. Um, so if the Fed wanted to buy your car, it would send you a check for $5,000. You would deposit that check in, in the bank. The title would go to the Fed for your car. And... You, when you deposit that $5,000, suddenly out of nowhere, there's 5,000 new dollars of reserves in the bank. And the bank would then lend it out, and through this um, multiplier expansion process, you would get eventually 10 times that or 500, oh, I'm sorry, $50,000 of new money. So no matter what the Fed buys, you know, your bottle of water, your laptop, it does so by printing money okay? and, and giving you a check, just writing a check on itself. And, and that then kick-starts the whole process of the money, increase in the money supply. This is what fractional reserve banking is. So I don't know if you can actually see this, but I, I just wanted to show you a few, a few um, steps in this. So, when you, you're, so if the Fed buys um, a U.S. Treasury bond for $100,000, if that's the bank there, the first national bank, look on the left side. The bank gives up some assets, $100,000 in securities, and in exchange, it gets $100,000 in reserves, okay? If you go to B, the bank's not gonna keep the $100,000 in reserves. In fact, that was created not by a deposit, so it doesn't have to hold any of it to back up the deposit. It was created by the Fed. So it would just loan out the full $100,000. So it would just simply create a checking deposit of $100,000 for some borrower. And that borrower would then take the money, spend it, and it would go, um, it would be withdrawn by that borrower, okay, so the checkable deposit would go to zero, but it would be spent on something else. And that would then go to, um, so, so I'll show you the, the steps. So we start with the following assumptions. The banks don't want to hold excess reserves. Again, in, in today's world, it's unrealistic. The reserve requirement ratio is 10%. Currency holding does not change when deposits and loans change meaning people don't take some of that new money and hold it in currency, which again is unrealistic. People do do that. You may take half the amount and hold it in currency and put the other half in, in a checking account. Um, and when a borrower writes a check, none of the recipients of the funds deposit them back in the bank that initially made the loan. In other words, everybody uses a different bank, okay? Uh, those are just some assumptions, but basically we can look at it this way. Let's say there's a, an offer, offer, uh, office building um, company that um, borrowed that $100,000 that was created by the Fed from the First National Bank, and it paid it to American Steel for steel inputs. American Steel then has $100,000, okay, in the check. Um, it writes, so it, it takes that check, it deposits it in its bank, the Second National Bank, um, and uh, the Fed is, cre and, and therefore the, the Second National Bank's um, account after the check clears, at the Fed is credited with $100,000. Now, they have to hold 10% of that to back up their checking account, of, of a new checking account of, of 100,000. So they loan out um, uh, 90,000, okay? And whoever borrows it, deposits it, in, in, uh, spends it, and the recipient deposits it in the third national bank, okay? And these are the, the, the key accounts. We don't really have to go through that. But just by the third round, notice that $100,000 in open market purchases has created a hundred thousand new dollars when the first bank loaned the whole thing out. When the second bank loaned ninety thousand of it out, ninety thousand new dollars, then eighty-one thousand. So in the first three rounds, the Fed has already created out of thin air two hundred and seventy-one thousand dollars in new money. Okay. So there's the Federal Reserve creating a hundred thousand dollars in reserves by buying securities. The first bank loans out a hundred thousand. Office Builders Inc. 
makes a payment to American Steel Company of 100,000. They deposit in their, in their bank. They keep 10,000 in reserve and loan 90,000. The third bank, it's eventually deposited in the third national bank, which keeps 9,000 reserves, loans out 81,000, so on and so forth, on and on, okay? So this is basically what you get. Um, when it goes through all of its stages, the maximum that, that, that uh, increase in deposits is 10 times the initial $100,000. One million new dollars is created, okay? Which goes along with the $1 million in new loans that have been created. And all of that is backed by $100,000, which is 10%, okay? So each bank holding deposits holds 10%. It's all gonna add up to the reserves that, the, that were created. Okay, there's another way that the Fed can increase the money supply. Suppose um, the, the Fed has a discount rate or discount window. Um, it charges an interest rate for banks that want to borrow money. Now, these banks tend to be ones that, are, that might, may be in trouble, okay? Um, but in any case, what happens is uh, the bank calls up the Fed, um, talks to the Fed loan officer, you know, whether it's in Philadelphia, they'll talk to the Philadelphia Fed, or if they're in San Francisco, in that area, the San Francisco Fed, and they'll say we need um, $10 billion, or let's say $100 million, make it more realistic. We need $100 million, okay, because we have insufficient reserves. So a few hours go by, the Fed loan officer comes back, calls back and says, you have it. Okay, where do they have it? Well, the Fed went to the computer and just added to the bank's deposit $100 million. So that bank now has $100 million that it can use for loans and so on. Okay, it was just done by a telephone call and a, key, and a couple keystrokes. That's how the new money was created. Uh, and so when, so the Fed can lower the discount rate. They don't generally do that anymore. Um, when they lower the discount rate, it's cheaper to borrow, so there'll be more reserves borrowed, and therefore the money supply will increase. But as I mentioned, this is not a tool that's used on an everyday basis. It's used to signal that the Fed may want to eventually increase the money supply. Uh, the Fed can also change the, re uh, the reserve ratio. So, for example, if you change the, re the reserve ratio, let's say it was 20% to 10%, suddenly banks, let's say there was um, $100, $100 billion of total reserves in the banking system, which means that there would be um, $1 trillion in, in checking account money. Oh no, let's say if it's 20%, it would be five times that. So if, there, if there's $100 billion, it would be $500 billion in checking account money. If suddenly the Fed reduced the reserve requirement overnight to 10% from 20%, that means that all banks would have double the amount of reserves they needed. They would have $50 billion extra dollars. They would all go out and loan, it, loan that money out, and that would, would, um, would circulate and increase the money supply. And the money supply would double from $500 billion to $1 trillion. So even small percentage changes in the, in the reserve ratio uh, can heavily influence the money supply. So my point is, they don't change the reserve ratio much at all anymore, okay? The last time they did it, as I mentioned, it went from 13% down to, to 10%. But they haven't reduced it, the legal ratio since then, okay? And then they've done something else uh, beginning in 2008. The Fed has paid interest on reserve, which I, reserves, um, that banks keep in the accounts at the Fed, okay? So, when the, so they're paying 0.25%. If they start worrying that the banks are gonna loan out a lot of these excess reserves which are now holding and cause the money supply to explode, what would they do? They'd raise the interest rate payment to 0.5% or 0.75%. So it would, it would keep the banks from making risky loans. If I can get 0.75% without risk, well maybe I'll just keep money there. So that's one of the tools the Fed might have to use once the economy picks up, once banks have more confidence, once borrowers have more confidence that they can make good investments, um, the, the Fed is gonna have a problem trying to unwind its position. It can also bring about open market sales. It can sell some of these, all these bad mortgages that it, it's accumulated. But if it does that, that will collapse the mortgage market, okay? It's gonna be very interesting to see how the Fed um, gets out of, or, or, or stops 
any attempt of, of the banks to, to, to um, loan out these excess reserves. So the Fed does have some problems controlling the money supply. As I said, when you or I take our money out of the banks, that reduces the bank's reserves. That's a power, that, can, that can be a powerful influence. As I said, during Christmas, when people pull out cash for shopping, you're going to find that bank reserves fall, and the Fed offsets that by injecting new reserves at the beginning of the shopping season after Thanksgiving, and then sucking them out at the end of the shopping season in January. Okay. Um, when banks have to hold more reserves than required, they make fewer loans and, and the money supply falls. Okay. So in other words, um, if banks were suddenly to be afraid and call in some of their loans, as their loans came in, they didn't reloan them out, the money supply would fall. So there are two things that can counteract what the Fed is doing. One is you and I pulling money out of the banks. That reduces reserves. Two, banks deciding they're not going to renew loans and they're going to hold these things as reserves. That will also decrease the money supply. But the Fed can continually pump in money through open market operations, so they still can exercise control over the money supply. All right. Now let's talk about money uh, bank runs. Okay, this is like one of my favorite things, um, and the money supply. So a run on banks is when people suspect uh, their banks are in trouble. They may run to the bank to withdraw their funds, holding more in, uh, currency and less deposits. And once the, for every dollar that you take out in currency, the bank then has no backing for $10, $10 of checking account money. They have to shrink their checking account money by 10 times the dollar you take out. And that's what the bank run is. So if we all uh, run on banks, they can only, they can only pay 10% of their liabilities, the deposit liabilities. The rest just disappears into thin air. Before we had a Fed, or before we had an FDIC, which guaranteed deposits, that's what happened. If you saw the, the um, movie, It's a Wonderful Life, that every, it's on a million times at Christmas, um, you know, and, and you see poor George, I forget what, what Jimmy, Jimmy Stewart's name is in that, in that movie, but um, he's supposed to be the good guy. You know, he stands up on, on, on the counter in the bank and, and tells everyone, well, you know, you, you put the money in here, but it went to your neighbor, we loaned it here and there and the other thing. Yeah, George, but the neighbors aren't paying it back, so people can't get the deposits out. Right, so, he, so he's not really the good guy, right? I mean, he's, um, he's, he, he, you know, he's duping everybody. Okay, whether or not you consider it fraud, I mean, he can't, he can't pay back. And that's a second thing about banks. Banks, not only are they, are they inherently inflationary, they're inherently unstable because of what we call the um, mismatch of maturities. The maturities of their deposits are very short, right? They're instantaneous. Checking account, checking accounts and saving accounts can be withdrawn. Um, they're called uh, site, site bills. As soon as you're within sight of the bank, you, you have those, uh, you can command your, all your checking account money to be given back to you, all your um, savings account money to be given back to you, okay? But on the other hand, that money's loaned out for three months, six months, 30 years on mortgages, okay? So the bank basically borrows short and lends long. That's, another, that's a very innocuous way of putting it. But what, what is really the case, they have deliberately mismatched the maturity profiles of their assets and their liabilities. Their assets are primarily short term or even instantaneous, if it's a, a claim, like a deposit claim on the bank, uh, while their, um, li uh, that's their liabilities, while their assets are um, all long term mortgages and, and so on, um, home equity loans. So under fractional reserve bankings, banks don't have enough reserves to pay off all depositors. Hence, banks may have to close unless they're bailed out. So you need a central bank to keep, uh, my position is that to keep, central, to keep fractional reserve banking going on a free market that's totally free, um, where there's no central bank, where there's no federal deposit insurance, uh, would be impossible. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be able to last very long. Okay? So whether it's fraud or not is a separate question. We can argue about that. But what, I think the conclusion of economics is that, in fact, you can't um, have fractional reserve banking on a free market. Okay? That it will very quickly collapse. And let me give you an example. Um, 
Okay, very impressive, right? That's the Washington Mutual Tower. Let me say a few words about Washington Mutual. Um, Washington Mutual, which was a, is abbreviated to a WAMU, WAMU, um, was a savings bank, actually, uh, and it was the, um, uh, the owner of, of Washington Mutual Bank, okay? So it was a holding company that owned Washington Mutual Bank, which is the main thing that it did. Um, it, was a, it was the uh, United States' largest savings bank, a, a savings and loan association. Savings and loan association makes, primar their, their loans are primarily for mortgage loans. It was also the sixth largest bank in the United States. It was a darling of Wall Street. Um, let me give you some figures here. It, uh, um, in its 2007 SEC filing, it held assets of $327 billion. Okay. Um, more than half of those were, were um, single family home mortgages, okay, about 180 billion. It had um, 2,200 branch, retail branch offices operating in 15 states. It had 4,900, about 5,000 ATMs, had 43,000 employees, okay? As I said, it had $327 billion in assets, the sixth largest bank in the US. Then something strange happened, or something um, upsetting happened. Uh, on September 2015th, Lehman Brothers, the Wall Street Bank collapsed, sending shivers throughout the, the, the system. That very day, a credit agency downgraded credit rating of WAMU. Um, within nine days, WAMU lost $17 billion in deposits. It was an online bank run, okay? People were just pulling, pulling their money out. Um, that's that's t almost 10% of their, of their assets. That's 10% that's that's of their deposits. They, 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 <clears throat> they lost all the... Um, uh, the reserves. I mean, they they lost most of the reserves. I'm sure they had some some excess reserves. Um, two weeks later, the mighty Wamu was no more. Just disappeared. Once people lose confidence in a fractional reserve bank, it disappears. I mean, it literally disappears overnight. People no longer want to accept or hold its deposits, and 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 the thing disappears, no matter what it looks like no matter how high its stock price was. Does that happen to any other business on the free market? It doesn't happen to any other business on the free market where it, it will disappear overnight. Um, when I gave testimony before Congress, I used the following example, um, and that was of uh, Johnson & Johnson that owned the Tylenol brand. During the 1980s, there were, um, was it 21 murders in, no, maybe it was seven murders in Chicago where someone had adulterated uh, Tylenol, the product, on the shelves, and I think seven people died. Um, there were a lot of serious consequences for Johnson & Johnson. Um, people, that the brand lost, I think it had 35% of the market, and it went down to like you know, 5% or, or 9%. But Johnson & Johnson um, followed up in, in a very um, open and transparent way. It showed that it had nothing to do with it, that it was a criminal. Um, its stock price took a small hit, but, but within a year, it had 30% of the market back again, okay, of the uh, pain reliever market. Um, so even, even, even murders of people, you know, even when firms are implicated with murder, they don't disappear overnight, that's what I'm getting at. But the brand name WAMU, I mean, that's, that just disappeared. It just went away, okay, as soon as people lost faith and confidence. And so it was a darling of Wall Street. Notice that its stock price started at $5, $5 in 1992, and it shot up to over $40 by late 2007. And then look how it plummeted. It went to zero. Okay? It went bankrupt. It just went to zero. Okay. So um, Mighty Wamu just, just simply disappeared. Uh, and that's what happens to fractional reserve banks when common people lose faith in them, the depositors. And that's why I do not think that it would exist on, on the market. Now, somebody asked me, and I have a, a few minutes, about um, if, if banks don't make any loans. Yeah, I don't care about any of this. OK. Um, if banks don't make any loans, then what, 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 what happens? You know, who, who would make loans? Um, well, there is, so there's deposit banking, which I said is not 
doesn't create new money, is not inflationary, doesn't have the ability to bring about crises or anything like that. Um, you would, so if you, if, you, if you want to deposit your money and always have it available so that you can write checks on it um, or, or, or withdraw it at will, then you would pay the bank to hold your money. Okay? You'd pay them a small fee every year, every month, whatever it is, to, to store your cash balances. That bank couldn't loan any of that money out. But on the other hand, there is something called uh, loan banking, which is completely legitimate, in which banks could make loans. And um, let me just quickly show you one or two slides here. Um, this is from actually Rot one of Rothbard's books. OK, so if you started a bank, you could do that, a loan bank. Okay, you put your own equity in, you put your own money in, you'd loan the $10,000 out, okay, or you'd have cash of $10,000. Uh, you then make a loan, okay. Um, you would make a loan at 10%, let's say, so that uh, you keep some cash. And, and if you look on the left side there, the IOU from the person you made a loan to would be $9,900. Um, you would now no longer have the $9,000. That person would. There's no deposits involved. There's no increase in the money supply. At the end of the loan, when the loan is paid back, the cash is transferred back, let's say it was a one-year loan, transferred back to the owner of the loan bank. The borrower no longer has the cash. Uh, the owner, in this case, Rothbard, has his cash back. There's no new money created in that. Uh, another quick, quick example. I think I have two more minutes. Um, let's say he, he wanted to expand the equity of the bank. Well, then he'd bring his brother-in-law in. Really, be the same thing, okay? So, if you want to go public and have have um, uh, you know, others, uh, shareholders, and so on, um, let's say not only your brother-in-law but others, those would be shareholders. They don't have the right to demand money. All they have ownership of, they don't have ownership of bank accounts. All they have ownership of is the IOUs, the loans. If those loans go ba bad, they're the ones that suffer. There's no effect on the money supply. They just don't get their loans back in one year's time or two years' time, okay? And finally, there's other ways that banks could, in a non-inflationary way, make loans, which Rothbard points out, and that is, for example, now you could not only have people, shareholders, right there, so you not only have $100,000 in capital from shareholders, but you could issue a long-term bond to someone that you pay interest on, let's say five years, uh, you'll pay it back after five years. And you could issue a three-month or a six-month or a one-year certificate of deposit. These people can't withdraw their money at will. Okay? They're bound by contract to leave it in the bank. All of that money can be loaned out and not cause inflation because they no longer have money. They no longer can write a check on any of that stuff. And finally, um, when, when the, the, the banks... Uh, Lends the borrowed funds, okay, so it's then transferred to the borrowers. They have it, these people don't have it, okay? So loan banking is inherently non-inflationary. There's nothing wrong with loan banking. Um, to the extent that banks do issue bonds or do issue certificates of deposit, they do not cause an increase in the money supply. They are not inflationary. The key in a free society, what I think would develop, where, where there was no central bank, no deposit insurance, would be uh, a separation of deposits from lending, okay? And I'll stop here. Thank you, Mark.